Welcome everyone uh, to the Solar Electric Investment Analysis webinar series. Um, we're going to start today a six part uh, web seminar series and we'd love for you to attend all of them. But if you can't, uh, we will be doing recordings so you can catch up uh, in between if you want. We're going to be tr covering uh, solar economic analysis or solar um, investment analysis and talking about really uh, solar electric systems. You know, I'm gonna say from start to finish, we're gonna talk a little bit about production and design. We're gonna talk um, quite a bit about, uh, about the value of the electricity and the value of the products that they generate. Also about economic analysis and follow through with how to do those economic analysis. And we're hopeful that you will be able to uh, do at least some simple um, calculations um, with for solar economic analysis. And if you want to learn how to do more complex, we think that uh, with a little practice um, after this web seminar series, you'll be able to do some fairly detailed solar economic analysis with any clients or, uh, or people you work with. And so that's uh, what we're trying to accomplish today. Um, Two people that are going to present this web seminar are uh, on my screen are myself, uh, John Hay from University of Nebraska. I focus on renewable energy and biofuels and uh, have been doing this for uh, a number, about 12 years focused on energy. Uh, we're really the most six to seven years doing quite a bit with solar and small wind. And uh, I've installed about a dozen systems myself, including one at my own home. And so I, I have a fairly good background on the physical um, structure of these systems. And then with Eric, uh, we've developed a pretty good uh, background in economic analysis of these systems as well. Um, Eric Romick is uh, from the Ohio State University and is an extension educator in energy, kind of a cohort of mine, and is, uh, does a lot of work there with solar, but also um, has done some work with um, other energy things like uh, natural gas and, and other energy issues that they face. Uh, but we have come together for this project. This project, uh, this web seminar is sponsored by the North Central Region SARE. Um, Eric and I received a grant from them to do some train the trainer uh, workshops. This is one of them um, that, we're, that we're doing and we're very happy to have you on. Questions today um, are, is best to type those into the chat box and feel free to type those in at any time and Eric will be monitoring those and if those are something we should we can answer right away we may do so we may also save that question to the end at the end we might also have an opportunity to ask some um, questions with your voice uh, we'll have some time to do that at the end uh, if you're interested in doing that so uh, welcome today, and uh, I'm really uh, I'm really glad to have you on. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice is uh, both Eric and I being in extension. We we truly do believe in in uh, the the values of the land grant system and the values of the extension system with respect to. We're not here to promote or dispel solar. We're here to talk about how it works, what it can do, what it can't do, and I can tell you that. I talk um, a lot of people out of systems and I talk a lot of people into systems. And basically what I do is I present the facts and the, depending on their interests and motivations, they can make decisions. And sometimes they realize that it wasn't as good as they thought. And some realize it was better than they thought. And that's where we get that fun mix. Um, and so we're really going to talk from a, maybe a, a positive standpoint of what can these do? What can't they do? And you'll get a good idea of these systems as we go through this, uh, this web seminar series. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, this is a six part web seminar series and we're going to start with estimating system production. That's going to be today. Uh, we're going to follow with uh, Eric's going to do assessing system cost. I'm going to do forecasting the value of electricity. Eric's going to do the next two parts, understanding incentives and connect and conducting a financial analysis. And the last uh, day we're gonna spend really doing quite a bit of modeling and looking at different case studies and, uh, and, and how to um, model a system. And you could then go home and model your own system, a uh, potential system or one of somebody you work with um, after that. We're also gonna spend a little bit of time on solar leasing um, during part four. 
And the reason that that is that we're seeing a lot of uh, farmers and landowners being approached by, by companies to lease their land for solar. So we're gonna to touch on some of the issues going on with respect to that. And hopefully that'll also help you have better conversations with, your, uh, with landowners in your area with respect to is that a good deal for them or not? And basically how to approach that idea of, uh, of considering a land lease. Mm -hmm. And John, just to kind of um, expand on that a little bit, um, we're going to be very clear and deliberate when we kind of make that transition. So 95% of what we're talking about here is behind the meter uh, distributed systems that are invested in, owned by the farm, business, or home. Uh, very different from you know a, a large scale solar leasing discussion. So uh, we'll we'll have kind of a hard pause and make sure that we're clear. Okay, uh, it's time that we put on our utility scale hats and think about uh, what are the trends and what are the leasing considerations. And and our hope is that we'll probably add uh, about ten minutes of that discussion on uh, module four. And then uh, possibly another uh, 15 minutes uh, of that discussion in week five, where uh, hopefully we will be joined by our Ag Law Specialist from OSU Extension um, that can kind of go over that and then provide some links for additional resources. Very good. Um, we are basing this uh, series on a bulletin series that um, was originally created by Eric Romick and Milt Geiger from Wyoming, Eric Romick from Ohio State, and Milt Geiger from Wyoming, and I edited it and put together a Nebraska version. That's what you're seeing on the screen is the Nebraska version of that bulletin series, and that can be downloaded by simply searching solar electric investment analysis, and you'll find that uh, pop up, and you could download it, and that could be a, a good uh, backdrop with respect to reviewing materials that, that uh, um, if you want to go back and do some reading uh, for yourself in the future. So we're going to base it on, on that bulletin series. It's also a great tool for anyone that works with farmers or small businesses to, to share that link or those resources with them as well. Very good. And, and pretty soon there will be a, a Michigan State version um, that is adapted for Michigan. Uh, there's an Ohio State version adapted for Ohio. So we're going to have a few different versions of this um, coming out in the future. The other main piece of technology that we're using or, or reference that is the SAM the system advisor model, we're gonna call it the SAM model. And that was built by the Renewable Energy Lab um, in Golden, Colorado. And it is maintained by them um, regularly. And so that's the modeling tool that we're going to reference throughout this uh, web seminar series. And that is the, the very in-depth modeling tool that you can use if you want very detailed economic analysis. But we're, we're going to go through uh, different calculations to do simple economic analysis and then we obviously prefer the more complex, uh, more detailed analysis, but at the same time, I think both have a place to be able to do simple analysis and more complex um, to get a sense of, of uh, what is the value of these systems. So we're gonna start with um, estimating production because obviously production is quite important. We're going to talk, this is kind of our my layout today. We're gonna talk about how they work, a little bit about um, estimating production calculations and then the influence of production of orientation, tilt, shading, degradation, and things like that. So here we're, we're going to go ahead and get started. This is kind of a just a background piece, but to say that um, any anyone interested in solar for a home, farm, or business should first obviously consider energy efficiency and consider have they done what they should or need to do with respect to reducing their demand because that's going to be the low-hanging fruit and so having an, a farm energy audit having a home audit uh, having a business energy audit is uh, is really good important step and that's because a lot of times that energy efficiency things are going to cost less to in, in, and have more gain than the alternative energies alternative energies tend to be the higher cost initial cost um, way to invest in trying to be green or save energy. So uh, you want to you know, really encourage people to, to take those initial steps. And if you have the ability to walk them through or get them in touch with resources that can. 
Um, so what factors influence production value? This is just a, a nice corn example because obviously a lot of us work with farmers and we live in farm country in, in all the states that we're in. Uh, but the reality is that there's two pieces to making money in corn production and that is what is my yield? How much corn am I growing? And what is the value of that corn um, on that base, on that point in time when I'm selling it? And we can all probably think about what is our, maybe our county average or state average, or even knowing our particular area of saying, this is what we can produce in corn. But every year is gonna be a little different and different fields are gonna be different because of soil type and other things. But it, if we're gonna to try to estimate how much money we're gonna make in the future, we have to come up with some estimate of our corn production, our average corn production, and try to estimate what the value of that corn is gonna be in price. Again, some of those are pretty volatile and a little harder. We're, uh, let's just apply that to solar now. Solar has to produce electricity, has to produce that product of energy for us to sell at the rate of electricity to make money. And so if it doesn't produce, that's like having a cornfield that doesn't yield. It just doesn't, isn't going to do well. So having a good understanding of what makes a solar array produce as much electricity as it possibly can and putting it in a place and, and installing it in a way that can maximize that production is gonna be the best thing you can do to make it uh, a worthwhile system. Uh, because really we can't change the price we're gonna get for the electricity very much, but understanding what that price is, is how we're gonna, what we're gonna talk about in the next session. Let's go over some, some terminology that we're gonna use throughout this whole thing and some that'll help you to discuss these. The whole entire system is typically called a solar photovoltaic array, a solar array or a solar PV array. The array would be the entire thing, including all parts. The module is basically a single solar panel. And I think it is perfectly fine to use the term panel or module interchangeably, just know that the industry uses the term module. So a module is a solar panel, a solar panel is a solar module. Within a module, there's a whole bunch of solar photovoltaic cells, and there is typically between 60 and 72. So 60 cell modules are very common, and 72 cell modules are very common. Those are the two common sizes of solar panels or solar modules out there today. When the tax import tax uh, was put in place by Donald Trump about a year ago. Um, he put a tax on imported solar modules, but also he, there's a tax on imported cells, but he also carved out a certain number of cells to, to come into the United States without tax. And that is because there are US manufacturers that um, manufacture modules from imported cells. And so just kind of when we look back at some of that tax stuff that happened, now you kind of see where that, uh, how that comes into play. That did change the price of solar a little bit, but didn't have near as big an effect as they feared. Part of that was that the, the tax put in place wasn't as big as what was feared. Um, I think they were asking for a fairly hefty uh, 50, 50 cent tax, and I think they got about 25 cents. Uh, so it, it made uh, not as big an impact as, as was originally feared. Most sol uh, solar cells today are made of silicon. There are a few other, tech, other uh, chemistries out there, but they work similarly as silicon. And so you could kind of imagine a, a similar kind of similar process, but with different uh, chemistries. But they're, silicon as a crystal made of sand has uh, some very special properties when it comes to electrons being able to move through the crystal and lattice of that crystal. And that's what makes it a, a good, uh, material for uh, solar cells. And so there's four valence electrons of which when, when sunlight hits them, that electron can move around throughout the cell. Um, the challenge is it doesn't know where to go. That electron doesn't know where to go until we give it an electric field. And so that's how a silicon solar cell is made, is an is a electric field is placed inside a silicon crystal. To do that, they put impurities into that silicon crystal in the form of phosphorus that has an extra valence electron, five versus four, and boron that has a one less valence electron. Thus you have a positively charged bottom with the boron and a negatively charged 
top with the phosphorus. So now we have a net negative charge on the top section and net positive charge on the bottom, and those two pull on one another and actually end up giving a permanent electric field in that solar cell. And so we have a positive side and a negative side. And then in in between, they call this the PN junction. So that's some terminology you might see when it comes to solar, the positive negative junction. Now that electron knows where to go. It wants to go towards the positive side because an electron is negatively charged. So if we think about that, when we add sunlight to this, this, uh, this piece, we actually uh, get that electron to get excited. It flows towards the positive side and can do work because it's an excited electron. So it lights a light bulb and then the unexcited electron fills the gap underneath. And so um, the metallic contact is the little fine wires at the surface of the solar cell that you can sometimes see. So let's just watch that again. That photon comes in, excites an electron, the electron flows clockwise around, giving energy to our load, and then recombines the electron at the bottom. Now, we can see this electron flowing in this crude diagram, and we can think that the electricity is flowing in a clockwise fashion. But the reality is, if we were to label this, we would not label it in that way. Because do you see our, my little red dots? Let's just watch that again. See these little red circles flowing? Those red circles flow in the opposite direction. They are actually the holes left behind by the electrons. And so those holes are actually what we consider the electric current. And if we were to label this solar cell, we would label the bottom side positive and the top side negative. I know that's a little confusing. We don't have to worry about it. It's just a, a kind of convention of electricity that the holes are actually the electric current flow, but it is interesting to, to know nonetheless that the electrons are actually flowing in the opposite direction of what we consider the flow of electricity. That solar panel or solar module has a rated power output. And that rated power output for this particular one is um, either 295 or 300 watts. And so that's, I'm gonna just write on the screen here, that's up here, 300 watts or 295 for this particular one. That's actually two separate solar panels. You can buy one or the other. But pretty much all solar panels have a very standard size. Sometimes their depth, how thick they are, is a little different because of their, their uh, uh, their rim or the frame that they're in, but they're about five and a half feet by by about just over a, um, over a yard, over three feet. So um, in this case, they're 66 by 40 inches, and uh, this uh, by about an inch and nine sixteenths. So they're all physically the same size, and that actually is something that's very positive about the solar industry today, is if I broke a solar panel and had to replace it and couldn't get the exact same one, I can just buy one that is similar and it has the same physical dimensions and it fits right in, doesn't really even look odd. Uh, so I've replaced them with different brands and I can't even hardly tell that I did it uh, on some solar arrays. So one got hit by a rock one time from a shredder and broke. So this, this 300 watts is under standard test conditions, which is 75 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, or 77 degrees Fahrenheit with uh, sun at 100, 1,000 watts per meter squared at a 90 degree angle into the solar panel. And those conditions don't exist very often. So the reality is that solar panel is not gonna generate 300 watts very often. It's more likely gonna generate less than that and so it's important to understand that, that although I'm rated at 300 watts under standard test conditions, my output is most likely gonna be less than that most of the time. So to look at that, this 300 watt solar panel really is going to act probably more like 220 watts most of the time. That's uh, its nominal test conditions or kind of more real world conditions. And so, um, but it's important to know that that although it's rated at 300, it's not gonna generate that, but uh, still this 300 is the, the number we're gonna work from because it's the one that's most common. It's the 
the rating of the solar panel at standard test conditions. Uh, this is just an interesting slide to tell you that as a solar panel, so this is under standard test conditions, that's that, that magic moment in time in the spring or the fall when it gets everything's right and it generates right at capacity. But as it gets warmer, the power production is going to go down. And as it gets colder, the power production is going to go up if the sun conditions stay the same. And now that doesn't mean that they don't produce a lot in the summer. It's just that they're slightly less efficient but they have better sunlight and more hours. So they actually produce more in the summer than in the winter. They just are slightly more efficient in the winter. So, and we're not likely gonna see temperatures above about here or really below, you know, about here. So that's really our working range for that, uh, that solar panel. Now I'm gonna teach you a, a little parlor trick. I'm going to teach you a little equation that I think is really useful and will help you to be able to estimate the production of a system using the calculator on your cell phone. You just pull it out while you're somewhere and you just make your little calculation and you could figure out how much that system might produce. It's also a good way of, of maybe sizing a system right there on a, on the front yard of somebody you're talking to. You could try to figure out what, what approximately size a system might they want. So this is a real simple calculation that uh, works surprisingly well. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to take the kilowatt rating, DC rating of the system. So in this case, I have a 10 kW system that I am looking at. I, am, I looked up the number for my area and that it has about five peak sun hours per day. Uh, throughout the year. And this is a, a calculated number. We, it's not about actual hours of sunlight. This is just a, a, about the solar irradiation during the daylight. And this website here, um, you could look up your location or a location close to you. I will tell you that as you get into Michigan and Ohio, this number might be more like 4.7, 4.6. As you get south maybe to Kansas and Oklahoma it might be more like 5.4 things like that because what happens is as you get more hours of sunlight less rainfall less cloudy days your number gets a little bigger but five is not bad for kind of the Nebraska Iowa South Dakota area um, 365 days a year and I'm derating by a value of course I'm saying this value is somewhere between 0.7 and 0.8 um, and that D-rate factor is basically the difference between that standard test conditions 300 watts and that 220 that I was talking about. And this is a D-rate factor that we just apply to a standard test conditions number. And in this case, I got 14,000 kilowatt hours a year. So the way I might use that, let's just go to the next slide. I come across um, a system like this and I say, this is actually a system that we installed as a workshop last summer. And here's my, here's my uh, participants that participated in my workshop and we built this solar array. You can tell it was pretty hot and sweaty that day. There's some sweat dripping off some of those guys. But how much is this gonna produce? Well, the first thing I'm gonna do is just count the solar panels. Well, I counted them, there's 48 of them. I can assume really a lot of solar panels today run between about 300 and maybe maybe as high as 400 watts for the most expensive ones, but 300 to maybe 350 is, is pretty common. So I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna assume they're about 300 each. These are 60 cell modules. And I'm gonna figure out that that's about a 14.4 kW system. So am I estimating about 14.4 kW? I apply my simple calculation to it. 14.4 times five peak sun hours, 365 days a year, D rate factor 0.8, and I get 21,000 kilowatt hours a year. So there's your little parlor trick. You know, you look at that, you do your little math, you say, that'll generate about 21,000 kilowatt hours a year. Where that's important is you could say, you could actually work it backwards and say, well, how much does your house use? Well, my house uses 10,000. Then you simply put in 10,000 here and make this X, solve for X, and you, you can figure out how big does my system have to be to generate equal to my house's production. Now, we're gonna talk about 
that size with respect to economics later, realizing that in most scenarios, we don't want to produce 100%. We really would rather produce somewhere between 50 and 75%. But we'll go over why that is as we move forward in this. But if I were to try to make that to be 50%, let's say my house used 10,000, I might change this to 5,000. And I want to be 50% of my 10,000. And then I can solve for X. And that would give me my size. That system size for 5,000 is going to be somewhere around maybe three and a half kW. And actually would be about maybe that big. So uh, to give you a little bit of a sense of, of size, theoretically. This is a ground mount system at a um, 35 degree angle facing south, just north of Lincoln. This is a, a basic line diagram. And I use this line diagram to teach a lot about solar, but I'm only gonna teach a very basic thing today. And that is that my solar is generating direct current electricity, which my house does not use. My house uses alternating current. So this is DC and this house is AC and the grid is AC. So we have to turn that into AC with an inverter. And so the electricity from the solar is coming into the inverter as DC and coming out as AC. And that electricity can go a number of places. It can go directly to my load and get used by my house. If my house isn't using enough, I can get more from the electric grid. And in a grid connected system, if I'm making too much, I can send it to the electric grid. And all three of those can happen just instantaneously whenever the electricity is, is uh, of whatever amounts. So those three things are happening. The challenge we're gonna face over the next couple weeks here is to try to determine the value of these three. Because that's going to be to determine the cost effectiveness of this system. And, uh, and it's pretty easy to figure this value out, not too bad to figure this value out. This one's the hard one. That one's the real question mark and depends a lot on policy and other things. And we're gonna talk a lot of detail about that in the weeks to come. Just an introduction, if we were to add a battery to that system for battery backup, this is what it might look like, allowing us to disconnect from the grid and run our, our load just completely from our solar array in the case of an outage. Um, in the case of an outage with the previous system, you're still without power. But in this case, we would have it, we would be drawing electricity from the battery. But batteries are very expensive. Um, I thought I had an off-grid one. I, maybe I get that messed up. An off-grid system would simply be just simply, you don't have that, you're off-grid. This battery better be pretty big and sized appropriately. Or you maybe you have a... Um, maybe a backup generator, a diesel generator hooked up that could also charge the battery. That would work as well for an off-grid. There are different types of systems and I'm just gonna introduce them very briefly and quickly to give you some terminology that we'll use later. But they look the same, but the, there are different configurations of systems that lead to different design desires based on the location. String inverters are the most simple where they have a, in this case, a string of solar panels connected to an inverter. And this has two strings, maybe string one and string two connected to that inverter. And that is the most simple way to uh, organize a solar array and the least expensive, one single large inverter though there are challenges to this application. One would be if I were to have a tree and it shaded one part of one solar panel, I just lost all of string two with one little bit of shade. And that can be a little bit of a frustration if I have, if I have shade. And so the other um, configurations are going to try to avoid that that uh, problem. But this is string inverters. If you have very little shade, this, it works very, very well and is the lowest cost way to do it. The second way is to have a string inverter. So we have the same string, um, two strings, 
but in this case, I have optimizers located at each individual solar panel. So I have a string of optimizers and a string of optimizers. And one of those things those optimizers can do is if I had shade on this part of one solar panel, I lose just that one solar panel and I bypass the electricity and I only lose part of that production. Um, only that one solar panel is worth of production. And so that's a value uh, with respect to shading. There's another additional value, which is that if the power were to go out, I, I can actually cut the, the electricity off all the way to the solar panel level, which is a safety um, thing. So for roof mounted systems, this uh, can work well because it fits the, the new electric code. The previous version we saw, if, if roof mounted does not meet the, the new 2017 electric code without an additional piece of equipment. It do, it, but ground mounted does meet the electric code. That's why it's, I still present it because if it's ground mounted, it, doesn't, it does meet the electric code. The, the last way is, is maybe the most simple to install, uh, but is the highest cost, and that is putting a small inverter on each one. So each solar panel has its own inverter, and it, it thus is its own kind of little mini system, and those systems are strung together. And again, in this case, if I were to have shading, I only lose just one solar panel. Also, when the electricity goes out, I'm losing that really to an individual solar panel basis, and I have, and it, the electricity is out, these are dead, these lines are dead, even in between them is, is uh, not, not functioning. So um, it, it's very good from a safety standpoint, but also for roof mounted systems, but also um, is fairly simple to install. Okay, those are the three and some basic design criteria with respect to why you might choose the different ones. A little bit about efficiencies of solar panels. I have a lot of people, really the ones we wanna pay attention to here are probably the ones on the market that are, uh, that we're talking about are gonna be these crystal and silicon cells, these ones in kind of this range here for efficiencies. These they do make, they put them in space um, right now, but we don't have them available in the commercial market. Um, but these ones in this area uh, are, and these numbers are the efficiencies. Uh, so the total amount of sunlight hitting, how much that's turning into electricity. I find this pretty amazing that a solar panel can take 20% of the electricity that, of the sunlight that hits it and turn it into electricity. We think about that as low efficiency, but I think about that as pretty amazing considering a, a plant can only take about 2% of the sunlight that hits it and turn it into carbohydrate. So fairly amazing um, conversion factors going on. But some people will say, well, well I want to be on the high side of that. Well, that may be true, but really what I want is a robust solar panel that is the lowest cost per watt. And the only time I want to buy, spend the extra money to gain efficiency is if I have a limited amount of space to put it on. Uh, because if I had uh, a limited amount of space and I might maximize the production with a, a higher efficiency. Well, if space is not limited, why don't I just put on a couple extra solar panels because my cost per watt is so much lower for the, for the ones with kind of moderate efficiency. So, but you can see that what the future holds, the future holds some pretty exciting um, efficiencies with multi-junction cells. And down here, we have some low efficiencies. They call this emerging PV, but the cost of these may be very, very low with some of these other um, technologies. So even though the efficiency is low, the cost might be low enough that those might work, be really neat, and we could put them in unique places. Some of them even uh, could be glazed on windows or, or uh, built into siding and all kinds of things if the price is low enough. So lots of exciting things that are potentially there, but really we're dealing in silicon solar cells today that are somewhere between maybe 16 and 25% efficient on the marketplace. It says not all solar is created equal. And basically what we're trying to say is that installation and where it's put and how it's installed, uh, it does make a difference with production. And so here's two examples. 
here's, uh, that I help install. One is a roof mounted system that's about 16 kW on the left and a ground mounted system that's about 10 kW on the right. Um, I can already tell you that, that if I was modeling these, the one on the right for, if I equate the production with size on a per panel basis is actually going to do a little better. Both are facing due south, but the one on the right has a tilt angle that is higher to maximize production. So you'd maximize production with tilt a little bit. Um, also, you get a little bit of extra heat on a roof mount that's gonna lower maybe by a, a small percentage, maybe at one or half a percent or 1%, not a big deal, but there are different types of installations. Both have pros and cons. The roof maybe has a pro, I have less cost in racking. You can see I don't have to have all this heavy racking. I've got just some simple racking structures on the roof. That's a lower cost, but I get, lose a couple percent of production. So it's kind of a give and take a little bit on different uh, applications. So roof mount and ground mount um, are the two places probably that you're gonna look. Um, the roof obviously has to be able to hold the weight. They're not real heavy, but they still have some weight. Um, ground mount, you have to have a space to put them and you wanna be able to put them close enough to your meter that you don't have to trench really long distances because that can add a lot of cost. The orientation of them in the Northern hemisphere, all solar panels need to face south. For a, this is for a, a rigid mounted system, you need to face south and the proper tilt angle is going to depend on the latitude, how far north you are. And the, there, used, there is a kind of a simple rule that says that you need to place them at a tilt very similar to your latitude. So if, the, if I'm in Southern Nebraska, that might be around 40 degrees of a tilt angle. Uh, because we're near 40 degrees north latitude. The southern border of Nebraska is 40 degrees north. Really the answer of optimum angle is just a couple percent lower than that. So 38 is actually optimum um, in that part of Nebraska, but it's very close to that. So if I move to uh, Minnesota, it might be, you know, 47 or 48 degrees, so a little higher tilt. And that's because the sun angle comes across the sky a little lower in the wintertime um, in, as you go north. And obviously in the summertime, it, it's gonna come across the sky very high, but that tilt angle is gonna give you the best of both summer and winter. You theoretically could move them, but again, sometimes I don't like moving parts. I don't like to have to mess with them. I like systems that are, are put in place and stay put um, because then they have less, less issues. If we, put a, if we put one in the Southern hemisphere in South America, we'd face it North. But in this case, we're facing them all South. Here's a couple of tilt angles of a system installed in Ohio. Um, you can see that if we were to look at their production, the time of year in the summer, these are gonna produce more. In the winter, these are gonna produce more. But in the overall year, it's probably gonna be this system that produces more in the overall year, yet this is gonna maximize summer production. This is kind of maximizing all year. And then if I wanted to maximize winter, I might put one even a, even a little higher tilt angle over here. Um, I also have a fairly flat tilt angle up here that's really flat up on the roof. So um, the angle does matter, but for maximum all year production, um, a close to your latitude is, is your best bet uh, for maximum year round production. I have talked to some people that say, well, I have winter load because I have uh, electric heat. And in that case, you know, to maximize winter production, you might choose on the higher side of that tilt angle, uh, just a bit higher than your latitude. Shade, shade is, uh, shade's a problem because people can think they can put up solar and then they don't think about the trees. And sadly, this is something that installers do sometimes is they estimate production and estimate there will be no shade. And you go out to the site and sure enough, there's three big trees that are causing a problem. Now, I will tell you that Ohio State did figure this out and maybe because they needed to cut the trees or because of the solar, but some of these trees have been removed since then. This was built uh, <clears throat> at an Ohio State research station. 
but obviously there's some shade issues going on with this particular solar array and its production is gonna be limited because of that. And in particular, anything that's partially shaded is probably gonna kill anything in a string with that. So likely this entire solar array is gonna be dead at this moment because let's maybe two of those lines, two of those strings are on one of these inverters. So you might have two strings of solar on one inverter. Actually, John, just uh, FYI, uh, that that uh, outdoor pavilion there has 44 modules. They're all on microinverters because okay. of the speed. Um, okay, so they did plan for that. And so in this case, the few of these over here might be running. You know, these may not be if, if we we're considering those colors drop shade. Very good. These would be uh, string inverters. These pictures on the right are string inverters. And these actually might be microinverters or optimizers here. Here's a good example of a, of a shade situation. This, is, this isn't my favorite uh, installation um, because it's, it's got some issues, but it, it demonstrates well the shade issue. This is put on with microinverters, but we can really simply say, this one's dead, 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 and this one's dead. And really probably this one is half dead. And so really the only production we're getting is from this one, this one, one, two, three and a half. Three and a half solar panels are generating um, in this, in this particular application at this moment in time. And this, you can see the person's house with a chimney there, um, kind of shading going on. Um, but th that's also why they did apply microinverters to this. They're actually getting some production out of this at this moment in time, versus if this was a string inverter, they would have had no production at this time. So, uh, so design's important. Uh, also, this is a wintertime picture. You can see because there's no leaves on the trees and also that tilt angle of this is very high. This particular system can change its tilt angle to follow the sun. Um, we'll talk about that detail in just a moment more. <clears throat> system orientation and layout. And I say orientation, you can see that these are applied in portrait. I'll call it portrait mode or not portrait. Uh, yeah, portrait mode or landscape. If we think about our, our uh, Word document or something, landscape is kind of flat and portrait would be upright. And <clears throat> the only real advantage or disadvantage here, and I think it's not real serious, but it is, it is worth mentioning, is that these cells are wired in series together like this. And so if we get shade across, or in this case, snow melt, and the snow piles up at the bottom here, this entire solar panel is dead. And actually all of them would be probably too if the snow piled up. While if the snow uh, started to melt and piled up and only covered the bottom part of this one, only these, this thing is still two thirds functioning because the part that is sun, has sun on it would function because these are, in series together, um, actually broken here with three strings of cells. So there, there is some potential in a high snow area where you could gain at least a few percent of production by putting them in uh, landscape mode. I'm not sure that's a real serious design consideration, but it is something um, that, that uh, others have thought about when installing systems in snowier areas. Also the tilt angle makes a difference. Um, the higher the tilt angle, the faster that snow is gonna drop off. So. Um, that does make a big difference. This might be about a 20 degree tilt. The snow is gonna fall off of this 30 degree tilt on the left faster than it is on the, the 20 degree tilt on the right. A couple more just uh, pictures of systems. Um, you'll notice that this one in the bottom right hand corner has a, um, a separate tilt angle and uh, it's changed the tilt angle from the roof. They were really trying to maximize production at a time when solar was very expensive. While really in, in today's marketplace, solar, the modules are only a small part of the cost of a system. So really you'd rather make it look right and add a couple extra modules than to 
make it kind of look odd and add extra cost in racking. So I, I do prefer systems quite a bit that just follow the same pitch as the roof, even though we're going to lose maybe 1% production, 1% or 2% production at the top compared to the bottom. It just looks quite a lot cleaner and a lot nicer. Um, there is degradation of panels. Uh, solar panels absorb sunlight and sunlight degrades the materials though it degrades them fairly slowly across time. And so we, they, they are warranted for this degradation. And so they're basically saying, if a system were to generate this much when it's brand new, it will generate 80% of that at year 25. And if it goes below that, if the degradation were ever to fall below this line, um, they would then warranty out the, the solar panels. So it's gonna stay above this line of where they will provide 80% of what they were in their new when they're 25 years old. Now, does that mean they won't run past that? Sure they will. They, they, if, as long as other damages haven't taken place, they'll run beyond that 25 years. It's just that degradation is going to be below 80%, um, is, which they, is out of the warranty time for the solar panels. So when we model systems, we model in this degradation into the system, while if you are doing some of those back of the hand simple calculations, you're not gonna worry about this degradation factor. We talked about tilt a little bit, how, oh, how to pick a tilt, but let's look at the influence of that tilt on the production. So this is a modeled system at Grand Island, Nebraska, which is about 41 degrees north latitude. And the Maximum per annual production is when that is right at about 40 degrees tilt angle. So if I were to apply this to a roof that had a 412 pitch, that has about a 20 degree tilt angle, and I'm gonna lose just a couple percent off of that. And so that is not a real major reduction. But if I, my only other option were to apply them on a flat roof, I, I have a pretty significant loss when I start applying them to a flat roof. And so tilt is important, but anywhere within about 10 degrees of optimum, maybe even 20 degrees of optimum, doesn't give you a huge loss. So you wanna be in that near optimum, but you can go a little, little higher or lower depending on uh, where you're at. And so that's where it's important to model those and figure out where, uh, what influence that tilt has. I did mention systems that will follow the sun. Single axis tracking follow the sun east to west. So in the morning, they might face the east, and in the, after, in the middle of the day, they're flat, and in the afternoon, they're facing west, and they tilt through the day. Um, typically, they just tilt with one axis, so they're actually maybe like this in the morning and this in the afternoon, and they tilt on one axis. But they can generate as much as as 20% more, but you do add moving parts and costs to that system. And we don't see a lot of distributed generation systems with, with tracking. We see a lot of the larger systems with tracking. I see very few systems with two axis tracking, which would do this, plus would change the, um, the north-south. Remember, this is east-west tilt. Then they would change the north-south tilt through the year. So they would be closer to zero in the winter time and closer to maybe 70 or 80% in the, or in the summer. And in the winter, they might be closer to 70, 80%. That'd be, it does both of those as two axis tracking. We gain a lot of performance, but at the cost of a lot of moving parts, which tend to break down. And so you really have to have a, be a tinkerer, want to deal with that extra maintenance, um, or really have a need for that added production to, to go to those two options. But they do add significant production. Um, here's another way to look at it. Um, I have a lot of people that say, well, I have this beautiful building that would work great for solar, but it doesn't face south, does not have a south-facing roof. It has a west-facing roof. And so then we might say, well, it's a, it's a, a roof with a 412 pitch, and if I faced it south, if it was south facing, it would generate about 12,000 kilowatt hours. Um, excuse me. If it was south facing, it would generate about 15,000 kilowatt hours. Excuse me. And if I faced it west, I'm going to lose uh, about three to 4,000 kilowatt hours per year 
Um, so fairly significant losses, but I can start to model that is that maybe is the electricity high enough value that that's still worth doing? This is where I can start doing some of the economic modeling and say, well, yeah, I did lose that production or wasn't able to get that production, but I still am making enough money on the electricity. It's worth it. Um, God forbid I have to face it north, then you lose a lot of production because if we're in the northern hemisphere and that just doesn't work very well, you really lose most of your winter production. So um, that would kind of be a way of looking at the east-west uh, facing of that. And if I was in between, maybe I had a southwest facing, um, I would be kind of in between the two. Um, there is a few instances where I might want to face it southwest or southeast. An example of that might be um, on some of the, on like the, the foothills of the mountains, on the Rocky Mountains, it can be important to face a little more east to get some of the morning sun because by the afternoon, it's cloudy and raining on, on many, many days a year. And that's where some good solar radiance data that can be found online as part of the weather data is very valuable in modeling systems to tell you what is the exact uh, best orientation of a solar array in any spot really on Earth. And so that's an amazing thing that we can do with some of the models today. Um, I, this is somebody, if you're from Nebraska, you might know um, James uh, Ruski. He uh, used to work uh, for the university and he put up a system in California. And I like one thing he said about this system. That there's two things he said that I think are important to solar. One is that, is that uh, should you clean them? And the answer is in our part of the world, if we're talking about the north central region of the United States, probably not, not worth cleaning. But in his part of the world, it is worth cleaning. Remember, these are in Southern California. And in Southern California, they are dry and dusty, and the electricity is worth 50 cents a kilowatt hour in the middle of the summer. And so he may only gain a couple of percent, maybe three or 4% production, but when electricity is worth very, very high rates, it's worth it for him to clean his solar panels. But the other important thing he said is that, you know, John, I've saved so much money with these solar panels. If, if I can get them to produce uh, X amount of electricity, I'm gonna put in um, a kegerator or I'm gonna put in a hot tub. You know, he's gonna put in a new device, a new load. Um, and he, in some ways, is justifying his purchase of, a, of something that, that uses energy because he's saving energy with his solar. He, and so the reason I point that out is that that habit, that uh, decision is something that we do either on purpose or just naturally as humans. It's a decision that we make. And so we may say, well, if we put in all this solar, we're gonna save all this energy, but then we justify using more in the process. They call that the rebound effect, and we don't get the overall impact we wanted to if we were to have just put in the solar and not changed our habits. And I can tell you that, that your habits can change without you really thinking about doing it. You just kind of go, well, you know, I'm gonna let that temperature up a little bit more because I'm generating my own electricity. Those kind of habits can kind of backfire on uh, your savings that you thought you were gonna get. Um, this was a, a remnant, I actually forgot I had this on here, but um, how you use energy is going to also um, impact your design. If you use energy in a more stable basis versus summer peak versus winter peak may determine how you want to install your solar to try to deal with the electricity you, you're using. Because as we'll touch on later, using the electricity you generate is more important, is more important than giving it back to the grid. If you use it, you get greater value for it. Now let's talk about one more tool, and this is my last slide. I know I'm running a little longer than I wanted to, but in my last slide, or set us a couple slides here, and that is that there is a, a simple model online called PV Watts, where you can go model a, sim a system really quickly at your location. And this is a, a screenshot of what, what it looks like, and pvwatts.nrel.gov. And what I did is I put in that 14.4 kW system, and I use standard solar panels, fixed open rack, 
I left the this system losses as they as this what they had it. I changed the tilt angle to what it was and the degree, the direction it faced to south, and I model and I simply put in. I selected my location at the first slide. Um, then I put in this the system size and I modeled it. It estimated what it would produce using very very good weather data that is it that they pull from their mapping software. And this is what it generated. It said it's going to generate 21,208 kilowatt hours a year. And what was my simple estimate? My simple estimate was 21,000. Yeah, that was kind of dumb luck that those two came in so close together. But I am telling you that that's where that simple estimate is kind of fun and can be really a good way to double check yourself. Um, they don't always come in exactly that close, but they're usually within about five or ten percent. Of, uh, of what the model will, will spit out. And so that simple estimation method I taught you earlier is, uh, is a good little tool. Um, the models are obviously better, but look at how close those two came together. Obviously, that's, we have the resources if you wanna go and, and, and look at those for, few, for, for uh, more information. And if you guys have any questions, please type them into the chat box now and we'll spend as much time as you guys want answering questions. If anybody would like to ask a question just by, with their voice, um, go ahead and just type your name into the chat box and we'll um, unmute, and we'll, uh, unmute you and give you time to, to ask your question. As we're waiting for questions to come in, I will say that uh, thank you for joining us and we will be on again on Thursday at 11.30 a.m. Central, 12.30 p.m. Eastern um, for our second of six in this series. Thank you for joining us today and we'll see you on Thursday. And we do have a poll question as you get ready to log off. Uh, go ahead and answer the question and ask us any, any other questions you have. Not seeing any questions in the chat box at this time, John, but we'll hang on for just a couple more minutes in, in case anyone has uh, a question they're working, uh, working in. Uh, but, uh, Overall, I guess my takeaway is is just kind of your your comment that uh, not all systems are created equal, and um, you know obviously the the more electricity we can design our systems to generate, um, the, the better off that's going to be in the long run as we start to get into these financial analysis. Absolutely. Um. We do have a question from Angela. <clears throat> uh, where is the link that we should go for the, the information on SARE? Do you have your uh, link for your bulletin, John? I, I have the link for my bulletin, but we are creating a SARE, uh, a SARE branded bulletin that is more general for the North Central region. And we don't have a link for that. That's one of the outcomes of our grant that will be coming in the near future. Um, in the meantime, they could use either the, the OSU version or the, the Nebraska version with their clientele. Um, right. uh, as John mentioned, we're going to do uh, one SARE branded version that is um, kind of general for the entire Midwest region. Uh, we've also um, kind of made it known with the state SARE coordinators that if there's a specific state that's interested in, in customizing one for their state, that John and I would be happy to um, to work with whoever that, that contact or statewide team would be. Uh, we can uh, very quickly help to generate some of the simulation models to put examples that would be relevant to your state. Um, you know, versus Columbus, Ohio, or uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, for, for example. So if you're interested in developing a, a version uh, similar to what you would see that, that John's putting up or the one that I'll put up here in a minute, uh, please send us an email, give us a call. Uh, we, we'd be happy to work with you. The, the bulletin series was purposely created in, uh, with a Creative Commons license. 
with the idea that we would share this uh, this this information widely. And we we are working with SARE to get it on their website as we get those uh, those those uh, resources completed. I put the link to to the my version of the bulletin series up. And I, I just submitted the one for OSU as well. Very good. Um, any other questions? We really look forward to, to having you on Thursday. It's going to be a, a good one. We're going to be talking about um, the cost of the system, how much these systems cost. Um, and, uh, and that should be interesting um, because it, you know, the, the, what people really want to know is how much does this cost and when does it pay back? That's what they ask. But we'll obviously go into more detail than that, but we'll get to both of those things um, over the next couple of weeks and how to make those, uh, make those calculations, how to help make those decisions. Great. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording and uh, we'll uh, end the webinar and look forward to uh, seeing everybody on Thursday. Thank you.